topic is acute respiratory failure and management. Acute respiratory failure is a process that if not recognized and treated early can be fatal. Many patients are at risk for a variety of reasons. So the key element is early recognition, assessment and management. Today, Dr. Ashutosh Kumar Singh is the speaker. He is Associate Consultant at uh, Sarvodaya Hospital, Faridabad. Dr. Ashutosh, please continue the session. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, uh, I, feel, I felt very delighted and I'm very thankful to the ISCCM and Indian College of Critical Care um, medicine for giving this opportunity. So today's topic is acute respiratory failure and management. Uh, as we know, this is a very important topic because uh, uh, we can't escape from the respiratory failure admissions and uh, criticality. So uh, this is a very crucial, important topic for any healthcare provider who is working in either emergency medicine or even in ICU. So I will start my discussion or topic uh, of this lecture from uh, a small, simple case. A 55-year-old male came to emergency uh, room with a complaint of acute shortness of breathing, fever, and cough. On examination, we found the heart rate is uh, 110 per minute, BP uh, on uh, 110 by 58, respiratory rate is on tachypneic side, saturation 84 at room air. And uh, past history, uh, he was diabetic from last eight years. And in ABG, we found that PO2 is 58 and PCO2 is 42, by cuff 28 and lactate is 1.3. In X-ray, what we found that the right lower lobe consolidation was there. Okay. So this is a classical case of pneumonia and presented in emergency room with acute respiratory uh, distress. So to start my discussion, first we uh, should recall that respiratory system because without discussing this all the system, uh, we can't delineate delineate the which where is the problem actually is going on. So respiratory system continues start from the pons and medulla, which controlling the breathing rate and depth of respiration, and it uh, always control the diaphragmic the main muscles respiratory muscle, which is diaphragm and accessory muscles also is there. Side by side, the carotid and uh, aortic receptor, which are located at the great vessels, near the great vessels, also send a lot of signals to the pons and medulla and uh, control the respiratory rate and breathing. So of course, if problem arises at the central level, we uh, we can get the patient of respiratory failure problem if it is in the peripheral uh, nervous system or chest or either lungs or even in the heart we can get the patients of acute respiratory failure if we uh, are talking about the respiratory failure we can't escape from that you know, knowing the alveoli and actual the sections of alveolar sac because when air coming from the bronchioles and after getting into the alveolar sac, how the gas exchange happen at the alveolar level, it is important to know because without knowing these things and without knowing the histological pictures of the alveolar sac, we might get confused sometime. So if we see the right side lower uh, picture, the structure of alveolus and human lungs, when air coming inside that alveolar sac and uh, there is an alveolar epithelium, which uh, and there is a slight gap which may be called the interstitial gap and then endothelium is there at this level ga gas exchange happen so it is important to know because if we have a problem in alveolar epithelium gas exchange will deficits and then patient came with acute res respiratory failure if there is a fluid in, in his interstitium then it may happen there is a uh, gas exchange is jeopardized. If there is a perfusion defect in the uh, endothelial level or capillary level, then we gain, uh, get again the patients uh, in respiratory failure. So this is very important to know. As uh, you all uh, listeners are in the nursing care, so you have to memorize how the blood is coming from the right ventricle to uh, the pulmonary artery and again pulmonary artery to uh, distributed all the bloods to the level of alveolar sac. This blood comes to this level only. 
and at this level gas exchange happen blood get oxygenation done and diffusion of carbon dioxide at this levels only so you should always keep in your mind how this um, blood coming from the right ventricle to this alveolar sac and how gas exchange happening so i will start introducing this respiratory failure as we know, this is one of the most common reasons for emergency uh, room presentation and ICU admission. Uh, basically, the respiratory failure is a problem of gas exchange. It is either oxygen or diffusion of CO2 or both. So conventionally, we can define it is an arterial oxygen tension, PO2 value of less than 60 mmHg while breathing air, or an arterial CO2 tension, PSO2 of more than 45 mmHg or both. So uh, this is a definition if we uh, theoretically ask for. We can classify this acute respiratory failure in four parts, like acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, which is called type 1 respiratory failure, acute ventilatory or hypocapnic respiratory failure, which is type 2 respiratory failure. Uh, basically, in uh, ICU, we will get mostly this type 1 and type 2 respiratory failure. But theoretically, we should know, we always know that the two more things uh, is uh, uh, more thing existing in our system. That is type 3 respiratory failure and type 4. We will discuss later on. Now, hypoxic respiratory failure, of course, type 1, which, which is hypoxic by um, name itself, that PO2 is level is uh, less than 16 mmHg or PO2, it could be normal or low. What happened in acute ventilatory or hypocapnic respiratory failure that PO2 partial pressure of oxygen is decreased and partial pressure of carbon dioxide is more than 40 mmHg. Of course, when it go more than 40 mmHg, patient presented with the respiratory acidosis or pH is less than 7.30. So if we talk about the type 3 respiratory failure, it comes mostly in the perioperative respiratory failure. Uh, as we know, the respiratory muscles get the cardiac output of at least 5% of the cardiac output blood flow if you're talking about the blood flow it is it will get the it is getting of the almost 5% of the cardiac output when uh, and type 4 respiratory failure which is the most co uh, commonly in during the shock as we know uh, the patient get into the shock that uh, respiratory muscle get hypoperfuse and patient develop this kind of respiratory failure, which is called type 4 respiratory failure. Now, these two type of respiratory failure will get uh, the mixed type of uh, ABG, like uh, of course hypoxia is there and it may get hypercarbia. In type 3, when patient is came into perioperative respiratory failure, there are variety of things which cause atelectasis because of anesthesia. There is a basal lung collapse or basal lung atelectasis. Patient may have pain, so he can't get breathe with the full tidal volume or full vital, vital capacity. So the atelectasis happened and patient went into the respiratory failure. So um, if we are talking about the physiology, uh, this is important to know how the oxygen uh, get up to the utilize actually. And before utilization, we have to know how this oxygen travel from environment or atmosphere to cellular level. Because uh, this is important to know that that oxygen cascade, this, this figure is actually oxygen cascade. How this inspired air, which is 20% of uh, um, that uh, air level, oxygen is 20% at this level and came to alveolar gases after mix, mixed with the humidif humid, after humidification, it came to alveolar level. And at alveolar level, it get diffused into the blood and from blood, the CO2 exchange happened and it came up to the arterial level. And arterial level, the main thing is to know what is the content of oxygen in arterial blood. It, it, um, it is in two types first in the diffuse free form and other one with binded with the hemoglobin. So uh, the free form of oxygen is mostly available for the utilization, whereas in crisis level, when patient gets some of hypoxia, then uh, hemoglobin bounded oxygen get free comes to the blood and utilized. So this uh, cascade is very important to know because the level you know 
uh, what is uh, what is the problem at the, which level then you can intervene at that level only if we are talking about the equations then it is very important to know the partial pressure of oxygen excuse me just give me one minute it is shown low one Sorry for interruption. Battery was down. So, so we are talking about the partial pressure of uh, oxygen at alveolar level. So it is important to know uh, the equation, which is the FiO2 into the barometric pressure at uh, um, atmospheric level, which is one atmosphere or 760 mmHg minus humidif after humidification, it is 47 and minus PaCO2 divided by R. So this uh, uh, partial pressure of oxygen is at alveolar level. And when it crosses to the arterial blood gas, it is mostly, most of the time, it, uh, five to 10 mmHg of difference should be there. If it, if this difference is widens or broader, then you must have to think that there is some diffusion uh, problem is there. Either it is the alveolar epithelial level or uh, interstitial level or at the endothelial level, okay? So if we talk about the uh, uh, hypoxemia, why it is happening, there are four pathophysiological mechanisms account for the hypoxemia seen in a wide variety of disease. The first one is ventilation perfusion inequality. The next is increasing shunt. Other is diffusion impairment. And other one is the alveolar hypoventilation. So ventilation perfusion inequality, if just think about it, the alveoli is getting oxygen and delivering uh, CO2 to the atmosphere. It is ventilation. Perfusion means your endothelium perfusion, how blood is coming or it is going after oxygenation to the tissues. So this picture will uh, some get you clarification. The upper part is alveoli that that dome shape it and below is the endothelium, uh, below is the capillary by which the CO2 is coming up to the alveolum. So there is a diffusion or gas exchange happen. If perfusion and diffusion of uh, perfusion and ventilation both is working fine, then V by Q ratio, that is ventilation by perfusion is one. So there is no VQ mismatch and your CO2 will be absolutely normal. When your perfusion is jeopardized and ventilation is normal, it means you are ventilating alveolar sac which is not getting perfused. It means you are uh, ventilating uh, alveoli that is a dead thing, that is a dead space ventilation because gas exchange is not happening with the blood or, endo or capillaries. So it means your VQ mismatch happens. Same thing happens when your alveoli is uh, blocked or by anything like uh, suppose there is a mucus in the bronchus or uh, there is a clot so your alveoli is get blocked but perfusion is fine so it means there is a shunting happening so it will uh, reflect in your abg obviously if there is a vis-vq mismatch either by the uh, emphysema low cardiac output or positive pressure ventilation if it is pulmonary edema asthma pneumonia it will automatically reflect in your abg Next, uh, next important thing is shunt. If there is a uh, perfusion is adequate, but your ventilation part is not working, then it means your blood, which is coming to the lungs, is going without gas exchange, without uh, diffusion of gases and gas exchange. It means it can happen. So, uh, so just uh, listen carefully. It can happen at the level of cardiac or extra cardiac, like at the level of uh, lungs or parenchyma of lungs. At the level of cardiac, you just, you have uh, heard or read about it, that VSD, ASD, where the blood is shunted from the right part of uh, heart from the left part without getting <clears throat> oxygenation or gas exchange or get uh, oxygenated of blood. So uh, it happened at the cardiac level. If we are talking about the parenchymal level or extra cardiac level, so it is uh, just mm -hmm. simple to understand. Blood is coming at the lungs level. It is uh, not uh, uh, participated in the gas exchange. 
it gave got uh, automatically into the left part of heart without participating in the gas exchange so shunt happens and it is uh, most common uh, cause it is one of the most common cause of hypoxemia and uh, you have heard about the ARDS a lot of uh, shunting happening and uh, the patient went into hypoxemia other thing is diffusion impairment see see if the problem is at the alveolar level if there is a thickening or destroyment of uh, destroyed uh, alveoli like in emphysema or there is a pulmonary edema so diffusion okay. get impaired and uh, the patient get uh, into hypoxemia or hypoxia alveolar hypoventilation see uh, uh, we uh, already uh, read about that partial pressure of oxygen uh, equation there is a uh, term FIO to the fractional uh, uh, inhalation of oxygen. If that is uh, low, like uh, if we are traveling in a mountain or a, um, where the oxygen pressure is very low, FIO2 is low, then of course patient uh, uh, went into the hypoxemia. Or if there is a decrease, uh, there is a, sen a CNS depression, patient is, uh, respiratory rate is very low, then again, the alveolar part is getting very poor uh, minute ventilation and went into hypoxemia. Of course, this kind of uh, um, uh, this kind of patient uh, came with the uh, sometimes hypercarbia also. This is not exclusively hypoxemia, but sometimes it came with the hypercarbia also. Most of the time, this hypoxemia presented in ER with the very typical presentation like tachycardia, tachypnea, patient become restless, hypoxic and anxiety, irritable, headache, impairment, impaired mental status. That is because of the hypoxemic encephalopathy. Patient may become uh, cyanosed when it is uh, uh, like the severe bronchial asthma. Patient, uh, patient is uh, coming delayed and uh, patient may came, go into shock, hypotension, convulsion, and sometimes coma also. So we have to always think prior to deteriorate uh, into shock and convulsion and coma. So um, always we have to be prepared. And why do you uh, why do you need to intervene? Because if hypo hypoxemia is continued, then of course that uh, your respiratory muscle is working on higher rate, higher rate, and it getting the more cardiac output, like up to 20, 40 percent of cardiac output in that state, and generating more amount of lactate. So increasing lactate leads to metabolic acidosis metabolic acidosis will further jeopardize your cardiac output and it will depress your cardiac functions it will leads to cns depression of course hypoxic encephalopathy is a feature so it will depress your cns so that further downgrade your uh, respiratory rate and uh, it will leads to shallow breathing Cardiac effect is there will be there because if a patient become hypoxic, their right ventricle becomes getting more dilated because of hypoxic vasoconstrictions, and uh, later on went into shock, and shock will leads to multi organ dysfunction syndrome. So there is a there is a vicious cycle. If you not intervene at the right time, you will lose your patient. So if you're talking about the causes of type two respiratory failure. There, um, we can divide it into, into the CNS depression, neuromuscular disease, and chest wall disease. Uh, the mostly the CNS depression came with a cent uh, respiratory center dysfunction. It can come with a drug overdose, hypothyroid, sleep apnea, CNS cause like stroke, tumor, uh, and some cases of you know, peripheral uh, neuromuscular disorder like you know, guillain barre syndrome, polymyelitis, myasthenia gravis, etc. And if the chest wall is diseased, like kyphoscoliosis, morbid obesity, and pneumothorax, etc., then patient came with the hypocarbic or ventilatory failure with increased PaCO2. So this, uh, uh, if we are talking about the management part, then management part will uh, include into investigation and oxygen ventilation. See, investigation, the first and foremost thing we need to do arterial blood gas and it will tell about your the type of respiratory failure and how much oxygen or uh, intervention that patient needed that will uh, give you a fair idea with the AVG. 
So we need to do CBC hemogram, biochemistry, lung function test. If a patient is uh, stable, then chest X-ray, ECG, CT scan, and uh, or tube to echo. If you are talking about the management part or treatment, then first and foremost treatment or drug is oxygen. The other, inter uh, the other intervention we need to do is facilitate that oxygen or gas exchange happen. Whatever we do in ICU with uh, in respiratory failure patient, uh, typically non-cardiac respiratory failure, we are trying to get that oxygen from uh, blood uh, from alveoli or environment to blood level or tissue level. That is the only target to deliver that oxygen up to the tissue level. Uh, that will help you to treat that patient only. So the most important thing, if patient came with a respiratory failure, we need and what is the patient status after getting that? Uh, after getting uh, that, we need to secure airway, breathing, and circulation. We can't escape that. Uh, stay from that because without securing an airway, the patient airway and uh, how much breathing is required and circulation is appropriate, VP vitals, uh, without knowing that, you can't um, go further. Okay. So, uh, after important uh, these things, you have to know the underlying cause why this respiratory failure is happening. This will give you a, a long term benefit in treatment or management part. So if you're talking about the nursing assessment, uh, the nursing assessment should start <clears throat> after ABC um, intervention done, that the most important thing, the past medical history. We have to know the past medical history is a patient is asthmatic or COPD was there or not, because uh, it, it will give you a fair idea how much patient uh, need intervention, how oxygen is required, how the other drug treatment is required. Uh, so these things you should note it down. That past medical history, what drug was going on before it was patient was taking any bronchodilator or not, because many times you will get the acute exacerbation of bronchial asthma or exacerbation of COPD patient. They will, uh, they definitely will uh, in requirement of more uh, steroid or more bronco, uh, long acting or short acting bronchodilators. So these are the things you have to know. Surgery, the past history, uh, what surgery uh, done in the, that patient, in, uh, is that patient is in post-operative ward or not? Because of course, in the post-operative ward patient came with a type 3 respiratory, you need uh, to intervene like uh, mm -hmm. like narcotics or pain uh, assessment or uh, giving some analgesic. You have to give a proper positioning of the patient. You have to give proper physiotherapy of that patient. There is a tachycardia or not. There's a tachycardia or not. Patient is fatigued with that respiratory failure or not. Because if patient is get fatigued, he is trying to, um, he is become more somnolent and more drowsy and later on patient get intubated. So you have to know the present status of his fatigueness or anxiety level. What is the sleep pattern of that patient? Is that patient of COPD who came with the OHA and very disturbed sleep or not? These things you should know. Patient with headache or not? Patient is restless or not? Ineffective airway clearance is not. When you will ask the patient what is the uh, status of that uh, secretions level? Is this secretion is thick or secretion is uh, more in amount? You have to know because if patient can't uh, get uh, clear by his own, you need to intervene immediately. Patient breathing pattern. Patient is breathing by uh, normal rate or shallow breathing is there? Is that there is there any gasping breathing pattern? Is there or not? You have to know because you need to intervene accordingly. What is the fluid balance of that patient? What is the intake level? Is that patient was on any diuretic? Patient came with the fluid positive balance or not? Is that lung is congestion or not? These all things will clear with the fluid balance intake or output level. Patient anxiety, level, more the patient will uh, anxious, more he try to um, hyperventilate. So you have to know that um, these things. 
what is the impaired gas exchange impaired gas exchange after seeing the abg you will get an idea about uh, these gas exchange uh, diffusion actually because uh, many times the emphysema patient when their alveolus sac is damaged the gas exchange will not happen so you um, uh, you will get an idea after getting all the history and uh, these things okay so you have to know the impaired nutrition level uh, if patient is in an icu from long time uh, the patient requirement level of uh, nutrition is he getting or not this is uh, these all things are important nursing for nursing point of view so if you're talking talking about the planning we have to intervene early simple if uh, you are able to give uh, proper uh, attention to your patient beforehand then you will uh, somehow will make make sure that patient will not worsen further okay so you have to prevent by taking the thorough physical ass assessment and history so may our main goal is to do abg interpret abg and um, intervene uh, with that actually because uh, the oxygen therapy is uh, only uh, and foremost technique uh, to uh, curtail that respiratory uh, deficit what is going inside the patient so just to know the what is the breath sound of patient there is a dyspnea or not patient can cough with uh, forceful cough or depressed depressive cough so it is important to know so if you are talking about the respiratory therapy the uh, as we uh, talk about um, murmuring from the past two three slide the oxygen therapy is most important and what whatever we have uh, that um, uh, equipments we try to deliver that oxygen uh, up to that uh, up to uh, capillaries or uh, tissue level so the first we have to intervene from the oral cavity level so if there is a secretion you have to suction all the uh, secretions uh, or make the patient to cough by either positioning or asking the patient to cough uh, nicely hydrate the patient if patient is dehydrated uh, hydrate the patient humidify the uh, oxygen level what we are giving chest physiotherapy is a very important role in uh, um, respiratory uh, uh, patients so you have to make patient position accordingly that secretion of in that lung should come out okay so uh, airway structuring of course we this is very important and patient if patient is not improving that then we have to apply the positive pressure ventilation this is a various method by which we can apply oxygen uh, as we know, the, when patient came to us, we applied different uh, type of uh, that uh, um, uh, equipments like uh, started from the low flow nasal cannula to high flow nasal cannula and later on uh, NIV, BiPAP and mechanical ventilation. So a lot of time I have seen that the nursing staff uh, doesn't uh, aware with that uh, uh, the what level of oxygen we are giving with the nasal cannula or simple face mask many times i have noticed that patient was on a face mask with the two liter of oxygen can we give a two liter of oxygen with the face mask no we should not we should not give so uh, this is important to know how much of fio2 we are giving with the different interface actually so with the low low flow nasal cannula we can give uh, up to 1 to 6 liter with the maximum 40% of FiO2. Uh, we can't give more than 6 liter of uh, flow with that low flow nasal cannula or nasal prong actually. So uh, you can uh, you can calculate even uh, in your notebook that uh, with the 1 liter per minute you can give 20, 20 to 22% and with the 4 liter 32% up to 6 liter you can give 40% of FiO2 with a simple face mask, you should not give less than 5 liter per minute. Okay. And you can give maximum 60% of FiO2 with the simple face mask. Venturi mask, it is important in uh, sometimes COPD or uh, um, COPD type of patients. And with this uh, mask, we can titrate, titrate FiO2 also. 
With a non-breathing mask, of course, we can give hundred percent FiO two, but it is a uh, it is a it, it will be given in some titrated patient because it can the high level of oxygen can harm also. And the other one is the high flow nasal cannula. With the high flow nasal cannula, of course, we can titrate the FiO two also, and we can give the humidified here. So these are the various oxygen delivery devices from the upper one is the nasal cannula and simple face mask, oxygen tent, oxymizer. The uh, lower one is the venturi mask, non-breather, high flow nasal cannula and bipap. Uh, I'm sure most of our listeners have seen it. So the last uh, in the low table was there, is there, uh, we can see with that non-breather uh, mask and nasal cannula, we can't give humidified oxygen. Uh, with the other thing, uh, with the other equipments, we can give humidified oxygen. So after, uh, if we are increasing, increasing or facilitating oxygen to deliver at uh, the alveoli level or blood level, so the other thing, the next uh, one is the mechanical ventilation. If you are patient deteriorating uh, on your NRBM or HFNO, then we have to um, intervene more. Like we can apply non-invasive ventilation, NIV or BiPAP. Or if uh, if a patient is not maintaining on, even on NIV or BiPAP, then we have to intubate or uh, start mechanical ventilation after intubation and ventilation. In some of the hypoxic patients like ARDS, uh, you must have heard about the prone ventilation. Of course, in COVID area, uh, award was there like self-prone. Okay, so self-prone uh, was uh, of course beneficial and that was uh, that uh, uh, self-prone was used a lot of time in different kind of patients, uh, COVID patients actually. But when your patient is not improving after intubation and mechanical ventilation, you have to prone. And um, uh, uh, the prone ventilation and ARDS part already covered in uh, the last lecture, I think ARDS already covered. So you can uh, listen those lectures on uh, Facebook or uh, your last lecture sessions. So uh, I will not talk about the prone ventilation. And uh, uh, if we further patient deteriorating, not improving after proning and all, then we have to start extracorporeal therapy or extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. And uh, most of the time, a patient, if patient is in acute respiratory failure, you have to start a uh, VV ECMO mode. Okay. So uh, this is a picture of VV ECMO mode of uh, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. So if we talk about the specific or supported therapy, then of course we have to treat the underlying cause. We have to maintain a um, fair cardiac output and hemoglobin concentration. This is very important because if we maintain the cardiac output and hemoglobin level, then it means key, it means you are achieving a good partial pressure of oxygen at alveolar level. And with the hemoglobin and cardiac output, you are maintaining a good content of oxygen at uh, arterial level or you are delivering a fair uh, oxygenated blood at tissue level. So this is a formula, uh, the partial pressure of uh, oxygen at alveolar level we already discussed. The content of oxygen at arterial level is hemoglobin into 1.34 ml into saturation plus that free uh, partial pressure of oxygen into 0 0.03 ml of oxygen per mm per dl. So, this will give you an idea about the content of oxygen at arterial level. If you want to improve that oxygen content at blood level or arterial level, you have to be a good hemoglobin level. That will give you a good content of oxygen level. And if you are talking about the delivery of oxygen at tissue level, then it needs a good cardiac output. That will deliver a good volume good arterial or oxygenated volume at the tissue level so it is important because if you have an idea then you will always think that patient is deteriorating patient hemoglobin is low then you always think about the transfusion of blood okay so you have to monitor vitals and saturation intake output of your patient there is no um, alternative of that 
if you if you talk about the drug therapy then different type of drug uh, group of drugs we used uh, in icu like if patient is having bronchospasm then we have to give bronchodilator uh, airway inflammation we have to give corticosteroids for pulmonary congestion we give diuretics like uh, lasix furosemides uh, or uh, um, sometimes torsamides we give uh, for lung infection, we need to give IV antibiotic. If patient is in anxiety, pain, and agitations, then we need to care of that also by narcotics or sometimes benzodiazepines. So these groups of drugs we uh, commonly used, commonly use in um, critical care settings. So I think uh, I covered almost. Uh, all things physiology, etiology, and management parts. So, can we uh, come into the uh, question, ma'am? Puno, ma'am? Yes, as it was, come to the question, right? So, I will ask first question. Uh, while caring for a patient who has been admitted with a pulmonary embolism, the nurse notes a change in patient SpO2 from 94% to 88%. Which action should the nurse take next? The options are increase the oxygen flow rate, suction the patient oropharynx, instruct the patient to cough or deep breathe, help the patient to sit in a more upright position. Uh, patient, uh, the participant can post their answer in a chat box. Participant can answer in the chat box or raise your hands. Anyone can, can answer? We will wait for the third, uh, I think, 10 seconds. Uh, yeah. Some answer is there. Yes. Uh, so uh, two of a person are uh, coming with that answer four. Some of the person with the instruct the patient to cough. Uh, uh, one person coming with the answer of increased oxygen flow rate. So uh, I think uh, uh, the, so answer is the increased oxygen flow rate. See, if patient is uh, suddenly deprivated, like your uh, saturation is getting down, First, you have to increase the oxygen flow rate. Okay. Anywhere, if you are uh, attending a patient on mechanical ventilation or on ventilator and patient is suddenly desaturated, then what you will do? You will first check your pulse oximetry. Is it uh, appropriately um, connected or with the finger or not? Or uh, then uh, you will automatically raise uh, your oxygen flow rate. So uh, this is the first uh, things you uh, should do, I think. Then after you will uh, look at the suction and look at the secretion or uh, ask the patient uh, to cough or uh, sit uh, more upright. Uh, these things will do after that increasing oxygen flow rate because uh, your intervention should be immediate. If patient deteriorated, like if saturation goes 70, 60, then what it will do? Of course, you will uh, increase the oxygen flow rate. Ma'am, uh, uh, anything you want to say? Yes, this is right. Uh, first, we increase the oxygen flow rate, which is the most important for the pulmonary embolism. And uh, after that, we go for the suction and cough and deep breath and uh, uh, sit in the upright positions. Okay, so this is right. So, next question. Patient of known case of COPD came with a complaint of fever, increasing cough with sputum and shortness of breathing. 
In our ABG showing pH is 7.38, PCO2 55, PO2 is 52, bicarbonate is 27. So what target of SpO2 you will keep in your mind while giving oxygen therapy? So tell me the uh, range of uh, number. Any participant can tell the only range. Patient having COPD, COPD patient, okay. No, no, we are not talking about the flow, SpO2. What SpO2 target you will think? Oxygen saturation. What is the oxygen saturation? Another answer is also there, 90 to 92 percent. Okay. 85 is acceptable. Okay. Okay. I think uh, 10 seconds is over. So um, we can target uh, 88 to 90 percent. COPD is fair enough. So uh, 88 to 90 percent will be the answer. So we don't need in these kind of patient uh, more than 92 percent. So we do. You don't target that 94, 96, 98, or 100 percent because it will further. Uh, deteriorate the patient because that uh, hypoxic drive is gone down and patient uh, uh, breathing rate is uh, further down and PCO2 level um, got up so patient can further went into uh, go into coma and all that you know, CO2 narcosis and all so you have to target 88 to 90 percent is fair enough 92 is uh, not wrong absolutely wrong but uh, 85 is uh, very low 85 uh, Ma'am, any comment on 85? No, no. 85 is uh, can be acceptable mm -hmm. if the patients are having uh, a severe COPD. Yes, okay, so yes. 80 is can be acceptable, but okay. target is 88 to 90 percent is uh, yes, yes, is more mm -hmm. because in COPD patient having a uh, chronic, then they compensate. Yes, yes, saturation. So uh, we are showing here a device. Uh, this device work on which principle? Archimedes principle, Charles principle, Venturi's principle, or Boyle's law? Okay, okay, okay. So I think uh, you must uh, all have used this uh, Venturi device in your uh, ICU or in your setup. So this is a Venturi principle. So this is an easier one. Okay, ma'am. Can we move to next one? All will answer. Yes, yes. Okay. So when admitting a patient with respiratory failure with high PaCO2, which assessment information should you immediately report it to healthcare provider? The patient is somnolent, patient complain of weakness, patient BP is 168 by 90, patient oxygen saturation is 90%. So, which assessment information you will immediately report? Everyone reported in the ICU when examining the patient. One answer. No, 
most of the person are writing answer D. D, yes. One is coming. One, one, one person write A. Mm. So, uh, answer is A actually. Uh, see, oxygen uh, here in uh, D option is already 90%. So 90% uh, is fair enough. Uh, you don't need to uh, bother more with the 90%, I think, because a lot of patients coming with the 90% and uh, you most of the time you forget to apply oxygen also in the 90% of saturation. So uh, BP is fine, patient complain of weakness, you not much bother with the weakness in ICU with patient coming with acute respiratory failure. So, of course, the patient is a somnolent. Somnolent means patient uh, high PC, PSO2, patient is in CO2 narcosis, patient uh, can't uh, make airway, uh, his clear airway and breathe further. He will uh, get into coma anytime. Patient is in, som in CO2 narcosis or CO2 uh, hypercarbic failure. Okay, so you need to, uh, need to intubate that kind of patient immediately or uh, urgently. So you have to report uh, urgently. Uh, what's happened uh, if, patient, uh, if patient in ICU, then uh, CO2 was very high. Then uh, uh, doctor uh, instruct to uh, sister or whatever, uh, mm -hmm. who will take care of this patient uh, to say ki if patient becomes drowsy, then you uh, immediately report me. Yes. If uh, saturation, uh, if uh, uh, PCO2 is 50 and if increase like 80, 90, then patient becomes more drowsy. Yes. Yes. Okay. So uh, if patient is somnolent, you need to um, treat urgently. Okay. So uh, that was my last question. That was my last, last slides. Thank you all. Uh, any comment, ma'am? Uh, no, this is very nice presentation and wonderful presentation. Uh, this is very big topic, but yeah, you may summarize very well, hmm. actually. Uh, initially, but, uh, yes, ma'am. Initially, I was confused what uh, should uh, I give him more importance. Uh, like uh, ARDS is uh, taking all the advantage in hypoxemic respiratory failure and uh, uh, CO2 narcosis is taking all everything in that side. So... Uh, I tried to limit and uh, more basic information yes, to be given. Yes, but uh, this is very uh, informative and wonderful presentation. Any if questions? any questions from audience side, 